listening to The Travel Podcast. Travel Podcast. Today's most exciting travel destinations. Brought to you by people with a real passion for travel. Great holiday ideas. Real reviews. Practical advice. And all the best deals in one simple podcast. The Travel Podcast. Now here is your host, Steve Witt. Everyone and welcome to the Travel Podcast where we aim to inspire you with some brilliant news, views and behind the scenes look at some of the most amazing destinations in the world. I'm Steve Wick, co-founder of one of the UK's biggest and best travel companies and as always I'm joined by our team of travel experts who all live and breathe travel every single day but most importantly they're super passionate about travelling the world. So today I am joined by um, a fantastic team. Do you want to say hi guys? Hi. Hello. Hi. So we've got uh, Matthew, Jules and Lauren, and we're also joined today by a special guest who we'll come to in a moment. But today we're heading off to an absolutely fantastic destination, which apparently has more snow than the uh, Swiss Alps. Apparently 90% of the population live on the coast, and it's also the largest inhabited island in the world and the smallest continent. Matthew, where are we heading to? So today we're heading to Australia and uh, our guest um, is going to give us an introduction to Australia. So we as a team are going to ask some great questions to really delve into what to expect when you go to Australia a lot of questions that we've had asked of us um, we're going to ask those to our guests who see we'll introduce shortly um, and just really give you an intro into Australia Um, later on we'll be looking at doing some other episodes delving more into the different areas uh, but this is more of an oversight into this wonderful country Fantastic so we are very privileged today to be joined by Ali who is destination trainer for Tourism Australia so I guess they don't get any better than you in terms of knowledge of Australia, Ali. Is that right? Um, I like to think so. Um, Hi, everybody. Thanks for um, tuning in. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think I've got the best job in the world because I just get to talk about my home country every day and get paid for it. So it's not bad. (laughs) Fantastic. So are you joining us from Australia or from the UK? I am based in the UK now, so I've lived over here in the UK for you know a bit over a year now. So I'm definitely missing Australia at the moment. And which bit of Australia are you from? So I'm from the North Queensland. Um, so if those of you that don't know Australia very well, it's if you imagine the shape of Australia, it's the pointy bit um, up in the top right corner of Australia is where I'm from. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm always a little bit naive when it comes to Australia. First of all, were my facts correct? Uh, yeah, they were actually, oh, that's, that's... except I don't think we're actually technically an island. I think it's because it's a continent, um, but yeah, we're fully surrounded by water. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we probably, you know, are an island. <laughs> well, I blame Google if it's wrong then. Um, <laughs> so, so today, like Matthew said, we're going to be talking about Australia for sort of the newbies, if you like, people who haven't been before, people looking to go for the first time. Now, because Australia is so far away and you just see it on the map, I tend to think of it as sort of a, quite a small little island in the middle of the ocean. It's not really, is it? No. So actually, Australia is actually the same size as the whole continent of Europe. So you can imagine when you put that in perspective, um, you know, traveling from one side to the other would be like going from Portugal to like Bolivia. Like it's quite massive. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, it is literally the other side of the world. How long does it take to get there? You're looking at, um, it's about, from the UK, it's about 22 hours, um, including stopover to get to Australia. Um, but we also have a direct flight, which is less than 17 hours. So that's from London Heathrow um, to Perth, which is on the west coast of Australia. So um, the west coast is slightly um, closer to the UK, um, as is the north of Australia. So it actually only takes you 19 hours, including stopover, to get to the north of Australia, Um, but 22 to get to the east coast. Fantastic. So (laughs) now we'll get the elephant in the room out of the way. Obviously, we are recording this podcast during or in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak, so no one's going anywhere just yet. But um, what are the current restrictions on travel to and from Australia? I guess at the moment it's it's not happening. Yeah, at the moment, um, the borders are closed for 
all tourists, um, you know, excluding permanent residents of Australia um, and Australian citizens. So at the moment, majority of the flights um, have stopped, um, except for like those repatriation flights going out. Um, and there is mandatory quarantine as well for 14 days for anyone going in. Um there's no, yeah, there's no indication of how long those precautionary measures will be in place, but it's it's similar to what the situation is in the UK. You know, the, it develops day by day, um, you know, forever changing. Um, but, yeah, I have no doubt that, um, you know, by the end of the year we'll um, be all back and open and recovered and back to normal. Fantastic. Um, so yeah. just how popular is Australia for the British tourist? Yeah, I think the UK is a really big market for us. I think Australia holds a special place in the heart of a lot of Brits. Um, I think a lot of people in the UK, they all have a family or relative connection down there. Um, there is that big draw card. So everyone's going down there to visit a mate or an uncle or some long distant relative. Um, and also the cultural ties. So um, we speak the same language almost. Um, we we share the same queen we drive on the left um and we share a big culture when it comes to sport as well so i think that a lot of the uk guys are always like oh you know when it comes to rugby or cricket there's that good rivalry there um so yeah it, it is a big draw card for that market for sure and obviously the sunshine that always helps <laughs> of course so we're going to be talking about some of the things to do when you do go down to australia um but Let's say the ban is lifted, we can start travelling again. Uh, typically then, what's the best way to get there? Do you direct? You said there's a direct flight. If not, are you going to route via somewhere? Yeah, um, I guess the biggest, um, the key airlines that we work with a lot um, will transit through kind of Dubai, um, Singapore, um, uh, yeah, they're probably the Dubai and Abu Dhabi as well. So most of them transit through that region. Um, but there is a lot of good stopover options. So if you guys like, I don't know, you're thinking about going to Australia, but you're a bit concerned about that long haul flight because sometimes that can be a bit daunting. You know, you think 17 hours direct or, you know, 20 hours, you know, to get somewhere. There is some really good stopover options just because the location of where Australia is. You can literally break it up. You can have a couple of days in Indonesia or Thailand or Japan um, en route to Australia as well. So, um, yeah, lots of different routes that you can take down there, yeah. So I've got a thousand questions, but before I hog all this, uh, Matthew, Jules, Lauren, have you ever been? Uh, I have lots of friends who and my sister and family have spent many months um, living out there. So I think I've had friends who've lived out there for 11 months at a time doing gap years or touring um, and relatives um, that live there full time now. So I haven't been yet. Um, I've mainly traveled west i haven't made it that far south yet but it's definitely uh, i think like ali's saying it's it holds something for all brits especially those who like outdoors and and sports um so it is a place i would definitely be getting to it's just haven't arrived there yet i've also yeah. never been and like ali said i have like most brits got a long distance relative living over there so hopefully it will be in the pipeline to pop over there at some point <laughs> Yeah, I've sent many of customers and like you said, mainly to go and visit their, their friends and their families. Um, but yeah, 100% would love to go. So we're all going to be just queuing a kangaroo, up. Just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if only you could see this right now. Maybe we'll do a screenshot of Jules hugging her kangaroo right now. He's called Skippy. Of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matthew. Yeah, so um, obviously you mentioned that Australia is the size of Europe, which really puts it into perspective of how big uh, the, the, the country is and the fact, like you said, it is a, a continent uh, rather than an island. Um, so what kind of landscape does that give travellers once they're there? Then obviously I know a lot of people think of it, oh, a lot of it would be desert or people just living by the coasts. Uh, yeah. Is there quite a difference in landscape throughout the whole country? Yeah, there is. Like, I think that a lot of people kind of think it's just like outback or bush in Australia, um, but it is pretty varying. Um, like, for instance, we've got rainforests. Um, we do have beaches, obviously, like 
all around the coast and not many people, which is a plus. So it's not unusual to be the only person on the beach. Um, We've got like the Australian bush is kind of like native plants and bushlands. Um, And then we've got the desert as well, which is like the red center. So that's kind of red dirt desert. Um, What else? It's kind of like a hinterland. Um, We've got quite a lot of vineyards as well. Like wine is quite big in Australia. So um, there's like that kind of landscape as well. Um, Yeah. And a load of islands too. We've actually got 8,000 islands within our borders. Um, So yeah, lots of different landscapes. And and with that, I know you mentioned the the bush in the outback. Are the bushfires still still burning? Um, and are there areas that are still off limits? Yeah, good question. So um, it seems like ages ago bushfires, but some of some people might remember. Yeah, that it was quite it was quite a tough start to the year for Australia. So the bushfire season. Um, which is something that we're, you know, kind of used to, like we have a bushfire season in Australia and you know that like growing up, you know, bushfires aren't really like something um, to be afraid of or anything, but this year was just unprecedented and um, yeah, they got a bit out of control. I think though that a lot of people thought that um, the whole country was on fire. Like I know being in the UK, the media just blew it really far out of proportion and I saw some images of maps that looked like the whole country was on fire but um it was actually less than two percent of the country um actually burnt but um yeah so of the top 50 destinations that in uh, regions that international tourists go to um none of them were affected um and those regional areas that were impacted they were actually already open for business and welcoming visitors um up until now so it's a bit of a double blow actually with um coronavirus but um yeah they're, they're gonna have they're gonna have their arms wide open when the borders open um welcoming travelers for sure um yeah it, it's quite amazing because um the australian bush actually like relies on wildfires to regenerate um and it's a pretty cool phenomenon to see because you can just kind of see how the native plants um regenerate and um, you know just a few weeks after the fires so yeah pretty much bounce back from all that and i think i saw the um some of the baby koalas the were affected and now being put back in then uh, the natural habitat yeah, that was just this week. So we actually, um, the first lot of koalas that were um, rescued from the bushfires um, were released back into the wild earlier this week. Um, there was 14 of them this week and they're doing another 10 or so next week. And that was from um, Port Macquarie Ko- Koala Hospital. And um, it's really cool that they literally put them back onto the trees that they were found on. And that's because that area had fully regenerated from the bushfires in the last you know, two to three months. Um, so, yeah, it was really cool. You could see, you saw images of the koalas when they came in. Um, you guys can probably, like, Google the story and that you can see them and they're all, like, burnt and, like, just really sad looking. And then, you know, you can see them putting back onto the tree where they're found and it's all green again and they're just stoked to be home. So, yeah. Oh. They're not actually uh, friendly, though, are they, koalas? They're just very, they're not not friendly. They're very lazy in terms of they sleep for like, I think, 23 hours a day or something. Um, And they don't like to be disrupted. So if you go near him and wake him up, he'll probably just grumble at you and then be like, why are you so close to me? Let me just get back to my sleep or chewing on a leaf. I know a few people like that. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and you mentioned you were from uh the nor- northern part north um eastern part was it northeast yeah, yeah. So yeah. how far yeah so obviously it's so big what's the what's it like to get around australia um via whether it be via plane or um renting a van or a car yeah, I mean, um, like I mentioned at the start, like we drive on the left, so that's always an advantage. Um, so a lot of guys, if you're going to go over there and like hire a car or a camper van, um, driving's an awesome option because we've got some like really cool um, iconic driving routes, like, you know, down the East Coast or like the Great Ocean Road or even through the centre of Australia as well. Um because of the size of Australia, though, often flying is the best option. So because of our size, all 
all regional cities and major cities all have an airport um, because it's just necessary. So you can literally fly to most major cities and towns in Australia quite easily and all airports are easily accessible as well. And then you can just travel the most amount of distance in the shortest amount of time. So if someone doesn't have um, that much time out there, then usually flying is the best option. Um, There's some good bus companies and tr- and rail journeys as well though so um if any of anyone listening is really into like their trains we've got some pretty cool train journeys that go right through australia as well um and they're quite like premium luxury um products so that that's quite a nice experience as well um i know some brits really like trains so <laughs> Definitely, especially for you. I think there's is there one through the wine region. I think there's a train up to the wine region. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, there's one that goes up to Hunter Valley in New South Wales, and I think they yeah. call it something like trains and wine or something. And I was like, perfect. <laughs> can you literally go end to end on the train? Can you what, sorry? Can you literally go sort of across the country on the train or north to south, east yeah, to west? Yeah, yeah. So you can literally go from. The east co- from the west coast to the east coast, or vice versa, all the way across. It's like um, four nights, I think, it's four days and three nights, and okay. you can go from the top to the bottom, right through the centre of Australia as well. So, um, yeah, there's 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 a, there's actually a program on TV. Um, it was like iconic train journeys or something. I can't remember what it was, but um, yeah, if any of you guys saw that one, that featured a few of those Aussie trains. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, it's obviously massive, um, but do you have like a seasons as such? Do you have like a summer, winter, autumn and spring like we do in the UK? Yeah, we do. Um, so we've actually got two different climate zones. So um, some people might not realise that there's actually different climates in different parts of Australia. So um, the Tropic of Capricorn actually runs um, almost through the centre of Australia. So the northern part of the country is actually tropical climate. So we've only got a wet and a dry season. Um, so it's similar to some of those Asian countries like um, Indonesia or Thailand, um, you know, where it's it's really just like the summertime, which is technically the wet season, is just it's quite hot and humid and a bit muggy and um, it could be prone to like downpours of just like a couple of hours and then it'll stop that kind of weather. Um, the, dr- the dry season, which is um, May to October, I'd say is the dry season in the tropics, which is the Northern part of the country. Um, that's, that's just, it's still, you're looking at like 30 degrees still but it's cooler in the nighttime um, and it's drier, so less less prone to um, downpours. But in the southern parts of the country, so that's places such as Melbourne and Adelaide and Sydney, um, that's four seasons, but they're the opposite way around to the northern hemisphere. So we have um, Christmas in the middle of our summer um, and we're just, so we're just coming out of summer now and then winter is when... The UK is in their summer. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, but it is it is fairly mild. So um, even in Sydney and Melbourne, in the middle of summer, uh, sorry, in the middle of winter, you're still looking at like averages of about sixteen degrees, um, and it's mostly sunny. So um, as people would know, that's still fairly warm. It's not um, it's not super cold at all. Yeah, brilliant. And would you say there was a best time of year to visit for like, so for UK people, uh, passengers to come to Australia, would it depend on where they were going, I suppose, as to the season they're going to experience? Yeah, I think it does depend when they're going and also what they, what they want to do. Like, um, for instance, usually the busiest time of year is kind of around New Year's. People want to see New Year's on the harbour. Um, they're escaping the winter over here. Um that kind of thing, but that might not necessarily be the best time to visit the northern part of the country, but quite often, um, you know, people want to see a few regions while they're out there, so you can't really um, avoid it. So it's just, it's not a bad time to visit. Um, It's just bearing that in mind when, like, whether, you know, whether you're using a travel agent or booking it yourself, you can um, 
just, you know, pick your day trips around that, I guess. So you're not doing a thousand things in a day. And when it's really hot and humid, um, it can get a bit dangerous, actually, because it does get really warm. Um, you don't want to dehydrate if you're out in the sun. Same if you're going to the outback. So the middle of the summer in Australia in the outback is really hot. Um, so it's just it's just bearing that in mind if, you know, you're pre-booking any, any day trips before you go and it's super hot, um, that it can get a bit dangerous um, in those, um, like, northern areas. Um, what else? And maybe animals as well. So if, if someone wants to go out there and, they're, like, their dream is to – um, maybe see the whales migrating, you know, up the coast or we've got um, turtles hatching or um, whale sharks, like those kind of things are seasonal. So it's worth checking, you know, what time of year it is. So whales are in the Australian winter. Um, turtles are like February, March time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, look into that as well. Or maybe sport as well. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, but maybe because um, we've got the Ashes next year, actually. So the cricket's on in November next year. So um, that could be a good one as well. I was going to say, because sport sport is a massive uh, thing, especially you mentioned the cricket, the rugby, the Lions tour. A lot of, a lot yeah. of people follow, follow them, uh, like the Barmy Army, especially for the cricket, um, which takes in multiple different towns. So is... Is the sports season predominantly in your winter if someone's there but wants to see like Aussie rules um, or is it in your summertime? Yeah, so for instance, the Aussie rules or AFL, we call it, is just kicking off now, which is going into the Australian winter. Same with our rugby league um, season. So if anyone's into rugby league, the Aussies are really into rugby league. So they, um, that's kicking off now. Cricket, however, is in the Australian summer. So that's after the rugby season. Um, so that's more kind of November, you know, you've got the boxing day test going re- to January. So, um, yeah, I guess cricket starts after the rugby and the footy finishes. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of like um, the sports and you mentioned the animals you can go see, for the sort of adrenaline junkies amongst us, myself included, what would you say are Australia's like bucket list experiences that you could only really do when you're in Australia? Yeah, I think that, um, I think one of the biggest draw cards for Australia is that kind of Aussie lifestyle. Um, so personally, I think, you know, if you're going on holidays to Australia, you just got to do some of those iconic experiences that are things as simple as, you know, going down Bondi beach, you know, just checking out the lifeguards and maybe learning to surf down there. Um, you know, ordering a flat white in the Melbourne laneways, as simple as that is, it's quite like a classic thing to do. Um, you know, maybe watching a show at the Sydney Opera House or climbing the um, Harbour Bridge. They're quite like, they're just quintessentially Aussie, you know, or having a barbecue down the beach. Um, we do have our... Our icons, though, like things such as um, Uluru or as Rock, as some people might know it, um, in the centre of Australia, um, the Great Barrier Reef um, and the Daintree Rainforest. Um, they're all things that are um, quite well known when it comes to Australia, and I'd say they're, the, they're pretty bucket list icons as well when you're down there. <laughs> Have you ever done the um, Sydney Harbour Bridge climb? Yeah, I have. And I, I'm not too bad with heights, so I didn't, I didn't think it would be daunting at all. But there's some parts of the bridge where you can see all the way through the floor down to, like, you know, the sea. So it, it is a little bit scary, but um, it's, it's really cool once you're up the top. You can literally see across the whole of Sydney, um, you know, past the Opera House. So, yeah, definitely recommend it. Have you done a slide dive, Ellie? Really? No, I haven't done a skydive before. I don't think I would ever be able to do that. <laughs> I think as well, you can do like diving with great white sharks and swimming with whale sharks. Is that something you've done before or that you recommend? Yeah, so you can swim with whale sharks off Western Australia um, and it is incredible. So I've done that and it's from um, Exmouth. So it's like Northern Western Australia. Um, and 
it's just incredible because they are the size of like a double decker bus and they just swim next to you. You're like so inferior in terms of they don't even notice you and they're just going about their day, you know, eating plankton and you're just swimming next to this massive thing. Um, and the stra- it's really good because Australian operators are actually really good and it's all like eco certified and um, every, all the profits go back into like protecting the animals and I think that's a really big thing for me me especially when I'm doing tours like that um but yeah that's a good one and you can also swim with humpback whales actually it's like one of the only places in the world where you can swim with humpbacks um that's on the east and the west coast um I haven't done that yet but that one looks really cool as well yeah Oh, that's so cool. There are so many experiences that you can do that you could literally, anything you could think of, you could do. Yeah. If you had to, what would be like one or two things you would say to someone for the first time going to Australia that they'd have to go and visit or do? Um, yeah, I think that, I think that one of the classic ones would be trying to get to Sydney, you know, check out the kind of, that's the kind of, um, classic Aussie things to do, you know, that laid back lifestyle, the inner city beaches, the, um, the culture in terms of the event scene, um, you know, all the cafes and restaurants and stuff in Sydney. Um, and I think the Great Barrier Reef is a must do as well. Um, it's just, it's obviously amazing. It's one of the seven wonders in the world, but it's just until you're there, you can see so many images of the reef and until you're there, um, it kind of hones in, how big it is and just how amazing it is once you're there yeah it is really big and I think that can be a bit daunting maybe for first timers do you have a sort of a basic itinerary that you would suggest to to first timers say for on a two-week break yeah um I think there's a classic one um that a lot of people kind of start with and that's called um sydney rock and reef and it kind of takes in a couple of those icons that i was talking about so um flying into sydney spending a week or so um in that region um because there's a lot of day trips you can actually do from sydney so you could even base yourself there and go to like the blue mountains um or hunter valley which is a wine region um yeah and then obviously exploring the city as well um and then flying to the red center so alice springs which is the it's quite an outback town quite known for its um like colorful characters and um outback lifestyle i guess um and that's where uluru is which is um it's the spiritual heart of australia um in the red center and it's where you can really get to know the aboriginal culture which is um, a really special experience that i recommend to anyone getting out there um, and then flying up to North Queensland, which is where you can experience the Great Barrier Reef um, and the Daintree Rainforest as well. So they're two World Heritage listed sites that are side by side. And it's actually the only place in the world where two World Heritage listed sites actually meet. So the rainforest comes all the way down um, to the beach and then the Great Barrier Reef starts. Um, and that's up near Cairns in North Queensland. Um, so that's three different regions and you could easily spend like, you know, six days in that Sydney region, about four days in, um, the outback, so in the red center. And then, you know, your remaining four days, had to add that up in my head, um, you know, up in North Queensland, you know, within two weeks, but that's a really good first time or itinerary, I'd say. Do you think two weeks is long enough? Yeah, I think two weeks is the minimum. So a lot of people um, think that you need like at least a month to get out to Australia. And that's one of the hardest things because, um, you know, a lot of people that I speak to are like, oh, it's so far. You know, I need to you know, take a sabbatical of work to go down there um, <laughs> when in reality you do you do only need two weeks to have a decent holiday um but i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend anything less than two weeks um and i wouldn't recommend any more than three regions within two weeks because otherwise you just spend the whole time traveling so you don't want to try you don't want to try and fit too much in like i think just like you know have a really good holiday within um within those two to three regions not trying not trying to go to everywhere in australia within that time because it'll just be too much and you won't make the most of it 
you mentioned that you fly back and forth quite often. How do you deal with the jet lag and getting over that when you get, is it easier going there or home? I think, yeah, I don't know. I think, I always think it's easier going there, but that might be because you're just so excited and you get off the plane and you want to get out and about. Whereas when you're coming back to the UK, you're either going back to work or, you know, it's not as exciting. But um, uh, personally, I mean, I've done the direct flight a few times um, and it's unreal. Like you get off your, I feel like you're already in the time zone um, and there's hardly any jet lag. Um, But even flying into the East Coast, I think the best tip is to get out into the sunshine, get some fresh air um, into you, try and walk around as much as you can um, and staying in the new time zone. So if you fly in and it happens to be 7 a.m. in Australia when you get there, you may not have slept, you know, for 20 hours. But um, if you try and, you know, stay awake, you can maybe have a nap, but, you know, go out and explore and then go to bed that night, you'll be absolutely fine the next day. How do you cope with 17 hours on a plane? Um, it's, I don't know, it's actually less than 17 hours. So I, I've actually done it in 16 hours, which is, which was great. But um, it's not too bad. I don't know how, because I guess when you get in there, what they do, so it's with Qantas, and what they do is they kind of control the settings of the cabin so that you so that you get used to the new time zone. So they'll dim the lights and feed you um, so that when you get off, your body's already used, used to the new time zone. Um, so that, that always helps. But, um, I mean, I love, I love watching a good set of series when I'm on there. I think I watched the whole series of Big Little Lies on my last trip and it went so quickly. <laughs> A great thing to do while you're traveling and yeah. um obviously like you said the at the start you've a lot of people go there because they've got relatives or potentially uh obviously everyone speaks english or a, a, a type of english are there any sort of australian slangs or classic phrases that people need to be aware of when they're traveling so they don't slip up for instance i know um in hawaii they call flip-flops um slippers and in australia they call them thongs yeah. Uh, are there any other little words that people may want to? I think the thongs was a good one because that's one that you can um, often get in trouble with because I know in the UK, obviously, they call a thong something else. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, do you guys, have you heard any? There's things like um, we say snags instead of sausages, um, which is, is a it, is, it, is Billy instead of a, a teapot or a, a kettle? Yeah, I think in, like, the bush, they'll say put the billy on, which is, like, yeah, like a, a bush kettle. I think that's what that is, yeah, um, which is similar to, like, an esky. Have you, do you know what an esky is? No, it's an esky. No, it's like a – oh, my God, I don't know what you call them here – like a cool box. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah. They, you keep things cool when you go out, like yeah. Oh, is, is that because it's called an Eskimo <laughs> cool box, and you just shortened it? Is that was it the brand? <laughs> Um, probably I would not be surprised at all because I basically every, all Aussie slang is because we just try to shorten everything. <laughs> For instance, at the moment, everyone's instead of isolation, they're all just saying ISO. I'm like, all oh, right. <laughs> trying to make it cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah but Get everything sounds it. better with an Australian accent. <laughs> Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> like we say Arvo instead of afternoon. Or bottle o instead of bottle shop. Um, what else do we say? You go to the servo, which is just a service station. Um, you like to shorten everything and maybe chuck an O on the end as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it. And um, like you're saying, with that, obviously, there's so much to do. But obviously, two weeks is and I, you know, the minimum, and to do three sort of regions. Um, if someone has been there before and has done those, is there any sort of hidden gems that you'd say, well, actually, if you just want to go and get away from a lot of where uh, tourists go, where would the locals go and explore Australia or go, where do the locals go on holiday? Yeah, good, good one. Um, I think that a few, like, lesser explored regions of places like, um, like in South Australia, um, Kangaroo Island is just, it's one of the regions that was affected by the bushfires, but 
it, it's actually seven times the size of Singapore. So it's massive, this island, but it is absolutely stunning. It is so nice. And a lot of like um, domestic travelers will go there. Um, similar in Perth. So Perth is um, just amazing itself. Like um, Kings Park in the middle of Perth is actually, um, I think it's three times the size of Central Park in America. Um and that's like an inner city park. So Perth is just like beautiful and green. And then they've got this island called Rottnest Island off the coast. Um, and it's a car free island. So you get around on a bike and there's these little marsupials called quokkas over there. And it's a real trend to get a selfie with a quokka at the moment. And if you if you look on social media, the hashtag quokka selfie, they are the cutest things you'll ever see. Like they've got little like smiles on their faces um, and they just they're not afraid of humans at all because there's no predators on the island. Um, there's no cars. Um, and it's just beautiful. Like the beaches are just like pristine. Um, yeah. Places like that. There's some, um, lovely places like on the South coast of New South Wales, um, as well, which are very much, it's just about kind of laid back beach lifestyle. And you know, they're really like, um, I don't know, like local towns where you can get all like, local home products and produce, um, incredible seafood, um, and lots of family run businesses as well, which is, it's just really nice to see. So I think if you're dri- if you're self-driving, there's a lot of those off the beaten tracks places and little towns, um, that you'll, you'll just stumble across them as you're driving up and down the East coast. And, um, I think, I think Australia is really well known for that kind of, um, welcoming attitude. So you just kind of like, can say good day to anyone and they'll say good day back and um you know you stumble across these towns and just meet all these people that are so welcoming and so friendly and i think that's the beauty of it and i think if if travelers are gonna you know yeah just get off you know out of those touristy areas they'll meet so many brilliant people like that for sure <laughs> so i think we could probably do a load of different episodes all about different areas and destinations to go to within Australia. But um, today was really just about the first timers. For those people who are probably thinking, I'd love to go to Australia, but it's probably just too expensive. It's so far to go. It's, it's, it's probably going to be really expensive. What would you say? Yeah, I think that at the moment, the pound's going to go a good way for the dollar. So that's always helps. Um, I think your what you get for your value of money is really good once you're out there. So even though, um, you know, it might seem like a big expense, you know, for the flight, obviously getting out there, you could take, you know, at least 10 days of work probably. Um, but I think uh, the quality of our products are really high. So for instance, you know, when you're booking your hotel, you're going to get probably like, um, you know, the equivalent of a four star for the price of a three star, for instance, in compared to other destinations, um, as well as, you know, our cost of living and our, um, that kind of thing. There's a lot of free things you can do when you're out there as well. Like we've got, um, obviously we've got beaches, we've got, um, you've got barbecues where you can just go to the supermarket and then go down the beach and use the barbecues all down the beach. Um, you know, lots of kind of way of life activities that, especially if you've got a family, like if you're heading out there with a family and you think, wow, it will be an expensive trip. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do where it doesn't cost much money and it might be just going down the beach. It might be just going, you know, to the botanical gardens or there's heaps of, um, free museums and things as well. So, um, I guess cause it's such great weather, there's a lot of activities you can do outdoors to, entertain kiddies or you know even adults as well sorry that um you know um are concerned about that and this question might be more for lauren or jules how far in advance do people tend to book australia because to me it seems like one of those unless you once in a lifetime things but it's definitely a big trip you plan so do, do you plan it in advance I would definitely say a lot of people do plan it in advance um, because they do tend to go for a longer time, sort of like three to four weeks. Um, you, I mean, you could do it last minute if you wanted to, but a lot of people do plan it ahead because they want to kind of get like a day-by-day itinerary as well. A lot of people want to get in the big sites and figure it all out to make sure that they're making the most of their time there. 
And the itineraries, like Ali was saying, you know, often include several flights, um, like Kangaroo Island. I know then there's a ferry involved as well. If they want to do self-drive, you have to look into the different types of motorhomes available or if they want to do more of like a minivan type thing. So I think it's just there's quite a lot more variables to, to think about when you want to go to Australia. And because it is quite far, you don't want to get all the way over there and then, like, oh, you know, with not not a plan in place of what, what you're going to be doing. You want to make the most of your time. And is it a case that you need to sort of book in for these things because they could get sold out, I guess, some of these popular activities? Yeah, I know as well on some of the excursions, particularly they limit numbers um, because they are really good at, you know, pre- um, preservation and looking after the, and conservation looking after their animals and their environment so yeah definitely you have to get tickets for certain things in advance and and also it's just knowing that you've got that booked um, because you don't want to turn up on the day and be disappointed cool so i've made lots of notes throughout all this australia is definitely uh one of my top places i want to go so i'm going to do a quick recap of everything and uh, if i miss anything do do uh, pitch in guys so um definitely after corona australia is open for business um forget what you've seen about the outback that's all you know outback is recovering it's open for business uh People tend to go for at least two weeks, if not four, but two weeks is a, is a great sort of minimum. There is literally something for everybody. It's uh, very much about lifestyle. People love the Australian lifestyle and just doing some of the real basic things and the things we see on TV and um, hear about the sort of iconic destinations, whether it be the Barrier Reef, the Opera House, Bondi Beach, cool things to do. You can do it on a budget. You can also spend a lot of money. Um, there really is something for everyone, but a great place to start would be the Sydney Rock and Reef experience. Great itinerary if you're going for two weeks to get you started. Um, and you can literally do anything from a rainforest to beaches in one trip. What did I miss? I thought it was pretty spot on. Good summary. <laughs> It is very much an emotional trip, isn't it? I mean, it's laid back, it's cool, it's iconic. It's one of the best holidays you, you're probably going to have, um, but it's just a really cool place to go, isn't it? Yeah, and I guarantee once you get down there, you'll want to go back. I think that once people go to Australia once, they realise there's so much to see. It's not as far as it seems. I think that's the biggest hurdle. And then once they get down there, they're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. And they literally get over it within a day and they're like, okay, that's fine. I don't want to go home. And then they're already planning their next trip by the time they're back. So I guarantee you, if you go once, you're going to want to go back. And that's actually one of the things I wrote down and forgot to say was um, enjoy getting there as well. You can do the direct flight, 16, 17 hours, but also why don't you stop over on route or on the way back? Actually have a bit of fun, make it part of the experience. Someone like Dubai or something like that, have an, you know, make it all part of the experience. Yeah, totally. Cool. Right, I think that wraps up today's podcast. Thank you very much, Ali. You've been insightful and hopefully we'll get to talk to you again and talk about some other destinations in Australia. If anyone would like to know more, then check out our show notes and we'll be linking to Tourism Australia. And also, if you'd like to talk about other destinations, then you can also email studio at thetravelpodcast.com. But uh, for now, thanks all for joining us. Thank you. The Travel Podcast is sponsored by Not Just Travel, where it's not just travel, it's a way of life. We hope you liked this podcast, and if you did, please tell your friends, but also take a moment to rate us on iTunes as it helps spread the word. Thanks for listening.